met a girl lost in a book, dream and the past. Although she said, jumped in a page, she smiled as she asked. Walked to Glenfern and we headed with Charlie. We drank an old leaf, we were toasted by a rabbit. We stood as they signed and I brought at the abbey. She took me to places that I never thought you could see. Hi, and welcome to another offering from Random Scottish History. In this video, we're going to amalgamate a couple of styles of videos that we've previously done. If you are a follower or a subscriber of Random Scottish History, firstly, thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. I almost don't feel worthy to have supporters for what I do. It's fairly niche subject Scottish history, so I very, very much thank you for your support. It's what keeps me going here, really. Secondly, if you've been a supporter for any amount of time, you'll know the types of videos that this will be an amalgamation of. So for a year up until the end of January there, we did monthly mini documentaries, hour long videos for Independence Live. And this is with the same view as that. This is a mini documentary on Scottish death and funeral customs throughout the ages, taken from newspaper articles, which many of the Independence Live information uh, came from. This is the Scottish press we're going to be sticking with mainly here. We are also mixing in some of the show and tell aspects of the show and tell videos I did, and I'll put up the playlist links at the end of this one for those that are interested to see what I'm talking about. The show and tell videos uh, actually incorporated quite a few wee bits that we'll be talking about in this video. The pocket watch made from human hair with the locket of the man and wife, and we don't know which the hair comes from, but for the length of it, we would assume it's his wife that, that it came from. Also, the fact it's a pocket watch tended to be mainly worn by men. We have a vet wearing the one that we showed off in one of the show and tell videos. We have a few more today to show you. We also have our... RSH mascot, or corpse, Yvette, who sports some original Victorian morning wear in the form of a cape and a veil, etc. And we also did a video that covered those items too. So we're getting into the very inevitable, yet some might say morbid, part of life by exploring death and its superstitions and traditions and the thoughts it inspires in people sometimes. I'm considered in some circles as a death positive person. I don't have a fear of death. I felt that religion was very interesting to me when I was growing up. I would visit churches of varying denominations in order to sit through sermons and see if any of it resonated. And I didn't find that it did. What I came away believing strongly was that religion was used by a large proportion of people as a social activity much in the way that there are those who, even after retiring, continue to work because it's become a social activity. There are certain people that they've become accustomed to meeting at a certain time and place and they feel lost without that connection. Church 
is that for a lot of people that I've spoken to. It's also for those who maybe can't see this one life we have as being all there is. The idea that we do only have this one minute speck of time on this planet puts the fear in some people. And they have to believe that there's something else. They have to believe that there's some other dimension or space in which they can continue in some form. And that gives them a sense of peace with regards to death. I don't feel that way. I don't have those fears. I am very happy to believe that this is all there is, that I'm going to go back to nature, that the circle of life is going to continue, that nature feeds and sustains us in order that eventually we're going to feed and sustain nature. I'm happy with that reality. I can understand that some people may hope, wish, or believe in something else, some kind of continuance. And that's okay. I People are free to hold whatever opinions they, they want. That's the right of humanity, free will. You have the right to believe and to act in accordance with those beliefs, by all means, unless it comes to your hurting of somebody else. Then someone needs to step in and uh, maybe put you on a different path. I've gone as far as to already have an advanced directive on my home computer's desktop. The advanced directive goes into what options and what I would like done with my body uh, post-mortem. I do not want embalmed, and that is a choice you have a right to make. You have a choice over every aspect of your death and what happens to your body after death. So I have chosen my coffin. I have chosen what to do with my personal effects. I've decided upon music and where I want to be buried. I have also provided passwords to all of my online accounts so that they can be closed and I have also offered final posts for varying social media and a final home page for the website. There's also a video that will go out at the right time and I'm I've done this with a view to offering a definite closure to my time on this earth. I feel as though it's been worthwhile um, the time that I've had here purely because I've been able to leave behind Scottish history and the ability for people to have access to information they might never have come across. So I'm very content that this is the way that life goes. You live, you offer the world what you're able to, and you pass away. That is the circle of life. That's As humans, I feel that's the meaning of life. Live, offer something constructive, life ends. New life begins offer something constructive and the world progresses and humanity moves on to bigger and better things. So we have already published uh, publications that deal with death a lot. The first and most obvious is Glasgow Square Mile Murders. These were four court trials that were taking place between 1857 and 1908. Very separate cases, not connected in any way other than they all took place within a square mile radius of each other 
just to the west end of Glasgow city centre. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle actually took part in the last trial eh, after the fact, after the verdict had been read and uh, the perpetrator had been jailed. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle played an intrinsic part in his liberation because there was no evidence not to give the story away for anyone that doesn't know of the Square Mile murders, but it, it, they're very interesting. That's that's why I wanted to get into them. Also, true crime is something people just seem to be into at the moment. So it made sense to, to offer up something that would be enjoyed by people or that they may find more interesting than any other subject. This is random Scottish history, so we we can pick which, whichever path we want to take for our offerings. Fortunately, it keeps life interesting. The other books that we've published that maybe aren't so obvious in that they deal with death are the Scottish Railway Incidents. We have published volumes one and two out of four, and they range from 1900 to 1907. And it's every incident that has happened on Scotland's railways that were reported in the Scottish press. And there were a lot, a lot of incidents. There was no health and safety. The details can get very graphic. And we're talking about multiple suicides, accidental deaths, terrible injuries, life-changing injuries, or that all took place on Scotland's railways. We'll get into what we're here to discuss. So registration of death was made mandatory to a civil registrar as of 1855, which was not early enough for my liking, and I think most historians would agree that having mandatory death rolls and registration is so useful when you're a genealogist and you're trying to track down family trees, you're trying to look into information about your family, or you're just looking as to who a specific person was for whatever incident that has you interested. Death rolls are so important and just so useful. So for it to be as late as 1855 that this was made mandatory seems strange to me. Prior to this, it was the churches of parishes that would form ledgers and records of deaths in the community. Where this would fall short is in those who perhaps died of suicide, the church may have a bias against recording that death. For those who were unbaptized, perhaps they would not be reported or registered. And those who are excommunicated are also likely to find themselves not taking part in the parish death rolls uh, post-mortem. So having a mandatory thing done by a government official meant that everyone was going to be recorded in the same way, without bias. At least that that's the hope, isn't it, really? So we'll get into these articles. From the newspapers, the Scottish press, we're going to go through them chronologically rather than by separating them into subjects like I did with the Independence Live videos. To begin with, from the Caledonian Mercury, for the 25th of May 1771, we have rites of sepulture. That tender and sincere affection which subsists among near relations and dear friends through life hath, in all ages and countries, Dispose the survivors to pay certain honours to their deceased friends, and to commit their remains to the earth with some peculiar rites and ceremonies. These funeral rites have been very different in different ages and countries, and have sometimes varied considerably in different parts of the same country. 
The sepulchral urns of the ancient Britons were, for the most part, deposited under barrows or large circular heaps of earth and stones, but as the bones of men, being at full length and without any marks of burning, have been found in some barrows, it appears that on some occasion the ancient Britons of the south buried their dead without burning. This was the constant practice of the Caledonians, or Britons of the north, whose manner of burying their dead is thus described, by one who had the best opportunities of being acquainted with their customs. They opened a grave six or eight feet deep. The bottom was lined with fine clay, and on this they laid the body of the deceased, and if a warrior, his sword and the heads of twelve arrows by his side, Above they laid another stratum of clay, of which they placed the horn of a deer, the symbol of hunting. The hole was covered with a fine mould, and four stones placed on end to mark the extent of the grave. There are many allusions in the poems of Ossian to this manner of burying the dead, from which we learn these further particulars. That the bows of warriors, as well as their swords and arrows, were deposited in their graves that these graves were marked sometimes only with one and sometimes with two stones, and that sometimes a cairn or barrow was raised over them. The favourite dogs of the deceased were often buried near them, but the most important and essential rite of sepulture among the ancient Britons was the funeral song containing the praises of the deceased, sung by a number of bards to the music of their harps when the body was deposited in the grave. To want a funeral song was esteemed the greatest misfortune and disgrace, as they believed that without it, their spirits could enjoy no rest or happiness in a future state. The Scots Magazine, for the 1st of August 1825, gives us from Chambers Traditions of Edinburgh, or Sketches and Anecdotes of the City in Former Times by Robert Chambers, Edinburgh 1825. Her ladyship, Lady Lovett, contemplated the approach of death with great fortitude, and according to the custom of many Scottish ladies of her time, made preparations for her own funeral. Not only were her grave clothes ready, but she had been long in the habit of having the stair of her house annually whitewashed and painted, in order that it might make a decent appearance to the company who should assemble at her obsequies. When on her deathbed, her son asked if she wished to be buried in the family vault at Beaufort Castle, she answered, "'Deed, Archie, ye needna put yourself to ony fash about me, for I dinna care though you should lay me aneath that hearth stain. I've heard that from people in modern times. My own mum at one point said that when she passed away, just stick her out in a wheelie bin and wheel her out onto the curbside for pick-up. There are some people that aren't bothered about how their remains are treated post-mortem. I'm not that way inclined. I have very definite ideas of what I want, but her sentiments are certainly still echoed today from some. The second article here is a longer article from the Scots Magazine for the 1st of March 1819, entitled Customs and Superstitions of the Scottish Peasantry at Births and Burials Mr. Editor, having read with much interest the communications of some of your former correspondents upon the popular customs and superstitions of Scotland, particularly those from Clydesdale and the Howe of Angus, I have been induced also to draw up a few pages of a similar description for the honour of my native district, which I now transmit for your instructive miscellany, and which, if approved of, I shall follow up with a second and concluding article. You and your readers will, I trust, pardon defects of style, as I am not in the habit of writing for the press. My only object is to assist in preserving those peculiar traits of our national character and customs which are so speedily wearing out under the all-pervading influence of commerce and civilization, but which, however rustic or ridiculous, we still love to associate with many pleasing and delightful remembrances. Birth, marriage, and death are important eras in the life of every man, whatever may be his rank or station, 
but among the common people they are generally attended with more eclat when the situations in life are compared. At death, many practices were formerly adopted and opinions held which are now almost forgotten. Until of late years, it was not only common, but admitted of few exceptions, for a great number of persons to assemble together at night in the house where the corpse lay, and there hold the like wake. The part consisted generally of young people of both sexes, where almost every species of rustic amusement, except singing and dancing, was entered into with avidity. Rural sports and games were adopted and generally so contrived as to produce forfeits, which gave a good pretext for tousling and kissing the lasses. The company was regaled with bread and cheese, beer and a dram, and the mirthful hilarity of the party was generally as unlike the occasion of their meeting as it is almost possible to conceive. A new squad assembled next evening, and the same scenes were repeated nightly until the corpse was interred. When a boy about fifteen, I recollect of being one among twenty at a like wake, and so excellent were the sports, and so keenly did they engross the attention, that I and one or two more attended two successive nights without having had any sleep throughout the intermediate day. I conceive this fact is sufficiently illustrative of what was generally going on upon these occasions. The house was often so full that there were not seats for the company, and I have seen the bedside where the corpse lay uncoffined, occupied by two or three from the want of other accommodation. An old friend of mine related to me a whimsical anecdote that occurred at a like wake where he was present. The company being short of sitting room, two young fellows were seated on the front of the bed, where the corpse was stretched according to the fashion of the times. One of the young men had a leathern belt about his waist, buckled over his jacket. His companion, an arch wag, recollecting that the deceased had a crooked finger, slyly and gently lifted up the dead man's hand and fastened the crooked finger in his companion's belt. Then, rising with an air of easy indifference, he walked to the door, from which, with counterfeit emotion, he called to the company that a house in the village was on fire. All got up, attempting to rush out. Among the rest, the man on the bedside also arose, but felt himself suddenly pulled back, and as he supposed by the dead person behind him, so powerful was the impression that he fell backwards across the bed in a swoon, from which he was with much difficulty recovered. A very strange and even wonderful story is still often talked of as having occurred some time in the last century at a like wake in this country. Mr. William Craighead, author of a popular system of arithmetic, was parish schoolmaster of Monifeath, situate upon the estuary of the Tay, about six miles east from Dundee. It would appear that Mr. Craighead was then a young man, fond of a frolic without being very scrupulous about the means or calculating the consequences. There was a like wake in the neighbourhood, attended by a number of his acquaintance, according to the custom of the times. Craighead procured a confederate with whom he concerted a plan to draw the watchers from the house, or at least from the room where the corpse lay. Having succeeded in this, he dexterously removed the dead body to an outer house, while his companion occupied the place of the corpse in the bed where it had lain. It was agreed upon between the confederates that when the company was reassembled, Craighead was to join them, and at a concerted signal, the impostor was to rise, shrouded like the dead man, while the two were to enjoy the terror and alarm of their companions. Mr. C. came in, and after being some time seated, the signal was made, but met no attention. He was rather surprised. It was repeated, and still neglected. Mr. Craighead, in his turn, now became alarmed, for he conceived it impossible that his companion could have fallen asleep in that situation. His uneasiness became insupportable. He went to the bed and found his companion lifeless. Mr. Craighead's feelings, as may well be imagined, now entirely overpowered him, and the dreadful fact was disclosed. Their agitation was extreme and it was far from being alleviated when every attempt to restore animation to the thoughtless young man proved abortive. As soon as their confusion would permit, an inquiry was made after the original corpse. Mr. Craighead and another went to fetch it in, 
but it was not to be found. The alarm and consternation of the company was now redoubled. For some time a few suspected that some hardy fellow among them had been attempting a Roland for an Oliver, but when every knowledge of it was most solemnly denied by all present, their situation can be more easily imagined than described. That of Mr. Craighead was little short of distraction. Daylight came without relieving their agitation. No trace of the corpse could be discovered, and Mr. Craighead was accused as the primum mobile of all that had happened. He was incapable of sleeping and wandered several days and nights in search of the body, which was at last discovered in the parish of Teeling, deposited in a field about six miles distant from the place from whence it was removed. It is related that this extraordinary affair had a strong and lasting effect upon Mr. Craighead's mind and conduct, that he immediately became serious and thoughtful, and ever after conducted himself with great prudence and sobriety. Such are the particulars of a story which, however incredible it may appear, I have heard currently reported by many different people who had no opportunity of hearing it from each other. Since I began to write this paper, I inquired at an acquaintance if he ever heard the story, just mentioning Mr. Craighead's name, and the particulars were again repeated to me, such as they were impressed upon my memory twenty or thirty years ago. There seems to be very little difficulty in accounting for the death of the young man, without any supernatural interference, for a combination of compunction and terror might have seized him after taking the place evacuated by the corpse, sufficient to suspend all the functions of life, but the disappearance of the other dead body does not seem to me capable of being accounted for by any natural cause, for it is by no means probable that any present would have had the hardiness to remove it to such a distance, and also subsequent firmness to keep their own secret. We must, therefore, give credence to the agency of some superior being, or disbelieve the matter at once. At death, many freaks are still observed, some of which are strange enough. When a person is dying, no one in the house of whatever age is allowed to sleep. For this I have heard no reason, farther than it was unlucky. It is also believed that when a person dies unseen, they who first discover them will die in a similar manner. When one expires, the clock is immediately stopped, and the dial plate covered with a towel. Mirrors are also covered in a similar manner. All the cats belonging to the house are caught and put in immediate confinement. The reason given for this is that they would endeavour, if possible, to pass over the corpse, and the first that they crossed after would be deprived of sight. When the body is dressed and laid out, a Bible is often put below its head, while a plate with salt and another with a piece of green turf is placed on the breast. It is also a common practice in some quarters of this country, should the corpse be conveyed to the churchyard in a cart, for someone, immediately after the coffin is put upon the cart, to say, Now what is that horse and cart worth? I have been at some pains to learn what is meant by this, but could never conceive any other reply but that it was the custom. Among the lower classes, the female relatives crowd about the door when the corpse is carrying out, and frequently give most audible vent to their grief. Sometimes the widow will insist upon carrying her deceased husband's head part of the way to the grave. The husband always walks to the churchyard and lays in his wife's head. Very absurd customs of feasting on these occasions formerly prevailed. On the evening before the funeral, a number of the neighbours, male and female, were invited to the coffining, and immediately after the funeral the same females and others concerned assembled to what is still termed the dergi probably a corruption of dirge, although the rites observed are very dissimilar. What I have just now described was once almost universal, and is still prevalent among many of the common classes, at an expense very suitable to their incomes and situations in life. Among those in the better ranks, such as respectable farmers and tradesmen, the company are all seated in the barn, where they partake of a good dinner and sit for an hour or two after drinking toddy, sometimes wine. Formerly it was nothing uncommon for the company to get very tipsy before rising from the table, but the practice of dinners is wearing out, or, when they do take place, the guests, with a decorum more suited to the occasion, rise very soon after. In the two neighbouring towns of Arbroath and Dundee, the customs at funerals are very different from each other. In Arbroath, whatever the rank of the deceased, 
Everyone who appears at the funeral is dressed in black, if he has a coat of that colour, if not, in his holiday clothes. All are invited into the house of the deceased and presented with a dram. If the person is of any rank above labouring people, a choice of wines and spiritous liquors, with a variety of cakes, etc., are on the table for the entertainment of the guests. Two gentlemen attend to serve them, and every one walks into the room, tastes of what he likes, and immediately retires to make room for others. The number invited will often amount to two hundred and upwards. In Dundee, unless among the higher ranks, the company assemble at the door in their working clothes, weavers in dirty linen jackets and shoemakers with their greasy aprons. This is not decorous. It shows a want of respect to the memory of their deceased friend, and indicates an indifference of mind and deficiency of feeling on so solemn an occasion. At least, such is the construction which I have often heard put upon this custom, so anomalous to the general practice on these occasions, and I beg leave to assure the nine trades of Dundee that their funerals have often attracted the attention, but never the approbation of strangers. No person is asked into the house, nor is anything offered. This is as it ought to be, for although some can afford the expense, the many cannot, and it is absurd to think of a poor widow who has lost the support of herself and family expending in this way what should feed and clothe her orphans, while every one can easily conceive the different feelings which unite to prevent her from deviating from the general custom. That article is courtesy of Tua Dunnis, from the Cars of Gowrie, February the 4th, 1819. Queen Adelaide's death and her final wishes gave Punch magazine an example to use, which showed embamming was seen as something like an unnecessary extravagance. In death, this estimable lady manifests the simplicity and delicacy of her nature. We are given to understand that in her final letter, delivered after her decease to the Queen, she desired that, in her case, there might be no embalmment of mortal clay, that there might be no lying in state, and lastly, that she might be borne to her grave by her sailors, certain of the crew of the ship in which she made her voyages to Madeira and Malta. The process of embalmment, for which Egypt, in her creed, may give a reasonable motive, has always appeared to us the last miserable custom in which the mortal pomp of Christianity vainly strives to vindicate itself, a poor design to cheat the levelling worm and set aside the universal sentence of dust to dust. It is well enough and a part of the mortality of men that such persons as Henry the Eighth and George the Fourth should be filled with spices and swathed in cera cloth, to be sweetened and preserved from decay, made mummies of departed arrogance. But for Queen Adelaide, her memory is her best embalmment. She is preserved in the recollection of her abounding goodness. And that article from Punch magazine was relayed in the Christian News for the 20th of December 1849. The Renfrewshire Independent for the 17th of April 1875 has for us funeral reform. The appointment of a public officer as suggested by Mr Hayden to verify deaths and take cognizance of all relating to interment would be of the greatest service both to rich and poor. Both classes are in great measure compelled from want of information as to details to leave much to the undertaker who naturally consults his own interest and recommends lead coffins and other needless and expensive items which possess the advantage to him of being very profitable. A public officer could give full assurance societies, removal of bodies from public institutions in the dwellings of the poor to mortuaries, and many other matters as to which great ignorance often prevails, causing much inconvenience. The cost of funerals, though much less than that of former years, might be even still further reduced with great benefit to the survivors, and without the loss of any respect to the dead or diminution of the religious rites. In spite of all that has been said and written as to its hurtful and demoralising influence, the practice of retaining corpses in the same room in which people are eating, drinking and sleeping still prevails to a great extent in this town, 
and health officers can only enforce removal in those cases where the deceased has died of fever or some other infectious disease or whether the body is offensive. The custom of wakes is still very prevalent, in spite of the efforts of the Roman Catholic clergy to suppress them, and the whole proceedings from the time when death has occurred up to the burial of the body is frequently one scene of drunken revelry. The only means by which these and other abuses can be corrected is by placing all arrangements connected with the disposal of the dead from death to burial under the control of the state. That comes from the sanitary record. And it's still the case today where the advanced directive of the type I've written up that I've left for my next of kin is with a view to saving them the expense of a funeral. I'm able to advise them, no, I don't want the gilded coffin that's hermetically sealed with a view to preservation of the body. Why would I want that? I'm dead. No one is seeing me again once I'm in the ground. The idea that I would have to be preserved for any reason is almost alarming to me. I feel as though the funeral industry still has a lot to answer for in terms of taking people who are newly bereaved and easily swayed, not thinking, maybe confused about what their loved one may have wanted, trying to do the best with this last token of respect by expending exorbitant amounts of money unnecessarily. It's one of the reasons why I would compel people to have an advanced directive of some type. It's more in-depth than a will, and it saves those who are left behind from any confusion as to what your final wishes might have been, and to falling into any traps where they may end up forking out thousands of pounds or dollars or euros to whatever funeral home or business they decide to to go to. It's very useful in saving a lot of later heartache and distress. They know they've not gone outside the bounds of what you expected. They know that they've fulfilled every one of your wishes because you've laid it out for them. You've given them a how-to of your funeral, and that takes a lot of the weight off the shoulders of remaining relatives and loved ones and family. We now have some comparisons between Scottish and Chinese customs, and this comes from the Evening Telegraph for the 12th of September 1887. Chinese Funeral Customs from the Globe Like Scotland, China has its superstition as to watching spirits and the unwillingness of the Chinese to help one in absolute peril of life is explained by a belief that the last man dead always acts as a watchman of the purgatory into which, according to Oriental tradition, the spirit of the departed first enters and from which he can only be relieved by the arrival of a fresh soul. For purposes of international comparison in this respect, a strange story is told of a highland parish. An old man and an old woman, dwelling in the same township, but not on terms of friendship, the lady, Kate Rua, being more noted for antipathies than attachments, were approaching the silent land. The good man's friends began to clip his nails, an office performed just as a person is dying but aware that his amiable neighbour was also on the verge of the grave, he roused himself to a last effort and exclaimed, Stop! Stop! You know not what use I may have for all my nails in compelling Kate Rua to keep fair a clay in place of doing it myself. We'll explain that last term a little. In the statistical account of Scotland, parishes of Kilfinnachan and Kilvickian, county of Argyll, were read, the inhabitants are by no means superstitious, yet they still retain some opinions handed down by their ancestors, perhaps from the time of the Druids. 
It is believed by them that the spirit of the last person buried watches round the churchyard till another one is buried, to whom he delivers his charge. In the same work, it is said, in one division of the country, where it is believed that the ghost of the person last buried kept the gate of the churchyard till relieved by the next victim of death, a singular scene occurred, when two burials were to take place in the same day. Both parties staggered forward as fast as possible to consign their respective friend in the first place to the dust. If they met at the gate, the dead was thrown down until the living decided by blows whose ghost should be condemned to porter it. It was the duty of the last person interred to stand sentry at the graveyard gate from sunset until the crowing of the cock every night until regularly relieved. This, sometimes in thinly inhabited parts of the country, happened to be a tedious and severe duty, and the duration of the fair clue gave the deceased surviving friends much uneasiness. The Chinese idea of watching the dead, a duty which amongst them devolves upon the eldest son and his brothers until the coffin is removed for interment, finds expression also among ourselves. Mr. Henderson, in his folklore of the northern counties, says... The corpse must be watched till its burial by one of its kindred and a stranger, who may be relieved when weary by another relation and another stranger. In China, the incense stick, which is straight, emblematical of the straight road which the spirit of the deceased ought to travel, must not be allowed to go out lest the spirit lose its way. With us, the seining candle must be kept burning during the night. And that little excerpt comes from Denny's Folklore of China, 1876. Another meaty article comes from the Annandale Observer from the 17th of January, 1890. Scottish Funeral Customs In these days of funeral reform, it may not be uninteresting to glance back a generation or two and see how burials were concluded in Scotland in the olden times. The innumerable superstitions so closely interwoven with the minutest details of everyday life were especially associated with the closing scenes of the earthly pilgrimage, the like wake or watching of the dead, and the solemn day on which the remains were carried to their last resting place in the old kirkyard. As soon as the spirit left the body, certain superstitious rites were carefully observed. All the doors and windows were open to give the spirit perfect liberty to wing its flight. Looking glasses were covered with a white sheet, lest the inmates of the house and the neighbours who gave their assistance in the performance of the last sad duties should behold some fearful sight. The clocks were stopped to show that the deceased needed no longer to note the flight of time. When the corpse was streaked, a plate of salt was placed upon the breast as a charm to ward off evil spirits. In some instances, separate portions of salt and earth are so employed the latter being an emblem of the corruptible body, the salt of the immortal spirit. Galliel, in his Darker Superstitions of Scotland, says the salt and earth indicate perhaps the relics of propitiation. In days gone by, when a person died, certain individuals, termed sin-eaters, were sent for to come and eat the sins of the deceased. They placed a plate of salt and one of bread on the breast of the corpse, repeated certain incantations, and then devoured the contents of the plates. By this ceremony, the deceased person was supposed to be relieved of such sins as would have kept his spirit hovering about his relations to their discomfort and annoyance. That comes from Folklore of the West of Scotland by Napier. In the absence of satisfactory explanations, the superstitious use of salt may be referred general to demoniac influence, yet the devil abhorred salt as the emblem of immorality, darker superstitions. If the limbs of the corpse retained their flexibility, it was believed there would soon be another death in the family. I remember a farmer's wife, where I was visiting, drawing my attention to this circumstance. In the case of her father's remains, and by a strange coincidence, her husband died suddenly soon after. The door of the room in which the remains lay was kept carefully closed, from an idea that if a cat should jump over the body, the first person who met it would be struck with blindness some day, or become afflicted with epilepsy. A great institution in bygone days was the like wake, or watching the dead. During the nights previous to the interment, friends and neighbours took their turn, generally in pairs to watch besides the corpse. In some districts, the night watchers were four in number. 
They remained till 4 a.m., when they were relieved by a fresh quartet, who undertook the morning watch. They were provided with whiskey, lights, and tobacco. These lake wakes were very often rather hilarious gatherings, especially in the highlands. A large company assembled when whiskey and rum were partaken of to a shameful extent, and as the spirit took effect, the revelry increased till all sense of decency was lost sight of. Sometimes music and dancing formed part of these entertainments. In such instances, it was considered the duty of the near relatives of the deceased to honour his memory by opening the ball. These festivities culminated in a grand entertainment at the Kisting or the Corp. This ceremony was usually delayed as long as possible in case a vital spark had not really fled. For this reason, the walk-in was a matter requiring considerable fortitude and attended with no little apprehension. Most families could relate startling legends of corpses sitting up in their bedclothes, staring wildly around and finally being restored to their friends. Much more gruesome still were whispered stories of somebody's corpse that for dark sins committed in the lifetime could not rest in peace, but would start up in ghastly wildness and require the presence of the minister to lay it. Hence the necessity for the plurality of the watchers, for the lights, and ready excuse for the whisky to keep up the courage. A writer in a popular periodical some time ago gave a very graphic description of a highland wake, at which he chanced to be present. Deceased was a ghillie, and the wake was consequently one of the poorest kind, though, says the writer, not the less typical on that account. The inside of the shilling was draped in white according to the usual custom. The piper at times broke into a dirge. When he stopped, the woman took up the wail, the chant consisted of an irregular verse or two with a rhythmic chorus in Gaelic and was slow and measured. Strong fiery whisky was steadily imbibed throughout the night by all present, with one exception, that of a young girl, a sister of the deceased. Mirth at that wake there was none, for those present were, with the one exception already noted, elderly, decent people, and the mother of the deceased, who was chief mourner, seemed to grudge the time that was not spent in mourning. After it was dressed for the grave, the corpse was visited by friends and acquaintances, each of whom made a point of touching it to avoid dreaming of it. Such was the superstitious reason given for the scrupulously observed custom of touching the remains, but the practice is probably a relic of the ancient and widespread belief that the corpse of a murdered person would bleed at the touch of the murderer. In olden times, robberies and murders were very common, and they were too often undiscovered. Every country district abounds even to this day in legends of lonely cottages for helpless women who were reputed to have something in an old stocking, as the saying is, were found dead from the effects of violence and their little hoard gone. Then again, packmen who tramped through the country with valuable wares not unfrequently disappeared from the road. In their case, of course, the body was never seen, but the place where it had been secretly buried was ever after believed to be haunted. I remember hearing of a farm not so very far from my native place where a patch in the cornyard, vividly green at all seasons of the year, was popularly believed to mark the grave of a murdered packman. If the body was disinterred and awarded Christian burial, the ghost of supernatural light disappeared, but, as may be supposed, this was seldom done. When the corpse was found, neighbours and all who came in contact with it would only be too glad to touch it to prove their innocence, for the superstition was widespread and was even alleged to be supported by divine authority in the malediction pronounced upon Cain. Thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. On this subject, King James the Sixth, in his demonology, says, In a secret murther, if the dead carcass be at any time thereafter handled by the murtherer, it will gush out blood, as if the blood were crying to the heaven for revenge of the murther. God, having appointed that secret supernatural trial of that secret unnatural crime. By the custom of Germany, the suspected person put two fingers on the face of the deceased, then on the wound and afterwards on the nail in presence of a priest who adjured him to appeal to heaven. 
In many other countries, the same belief was entertained, and alleged instances given in their records in which it had really happened. It was, however, a formidable and precarious test, fraught with danger to the innocent and release to the guilty. But there were other visitors in the house of mourning. Had a child been born with what was called a cherry or strawberry mark upon its face, the spot was sure to disappear if rubbed by the dead man's hand. Wens, or cysts, were also curable by the same process, the idea being that as the hand of the dead man wasted away in the silence of the tomb, so would the tumour gradually decrease. Again, Og might be removed by burying under the threshold a bag containing the parings of a dead man's nails and some of the hairs of his head. So extraordinary were the beliefs of a credulous age. When visiting the remains, it was customary to make some remarks concerning the deceased, such as, He is recht like himself. She'll be sair missed woman. Or in the case of a child or young person, Peer thing, he or she's. Weel awa fe a weary wordle. The latter being a homely rendering of the famous saying, Whom the gods love die young. When a death occurred, the bees had to be told of it, and a bit of crepe put in the hive, lest the useful little insects should take offence and leave the place. One or two of the very near relatives had a handkerchief cut out of the corner of the shroud, and in many cases the initials were marked with a hair from the head of the loved one who had gone before. This touching relic was carefully cherished in memoriam, and only used on special occasions such as communion, sabbaths, baptisms, etc. The funeral was a great affair and entailed a heavy expenditure on the surviving relatives. What was known as a decent burial required a lavish profusion of eatables and, what was worse, liquors of various kinds. Far and near, invitations or warnings were given, and as generally two-thirds more were invited than could be accommodated in the barn, which was usually set apart to receive the company, relay after relay was entertained in regular succession. The invitations were issued for ten o'clock a.m., but as the lifting did not take place till one or two in the afternoon, it will be obvious that there was ample time for the mourners to get very much the worse of the potent liquors they so freely indulged in during the interval. The order of refreshment was as follows. On arriving at the barn door, each person was met by one of the chief mourners, who handed him a glass of whiskey and a bit of burial bread, generally short bread or currant bun. When he had drunk the contents of the glass, he was led to a seat and presented with another. His next proceeding was to help himself to a pipe and tobacco from an abundant supply provided by the family of the deceased and placed on a table near the door. Presently, a service of strong ale with cheese and bread was next handed round, followed later on by toddy, brewed and water pails. Strong drink at funerals is now almost, if not altogether, unknown, and the dark superstitions, which so greatly added to the gloom of the shadow, are well nigh forgotten. In more remote times it was customary to carry the coffin on hand spokes, as it was believed that no horse would ever thrive which had once drawn a corpse. It was a custom with some to burn the straw on which a dead body had lain, and to examine the ashes narrowly, from the belief that the print of the individual's foot, who was next to be carried to the grave, would be discovered. This is from Old Customs by Guthrie. There was a widespread prejudice against burial on the north side of the kirk, that portion of the burying ground being devoted to the interment of unbaptized infants, excommunicated persons, or suicides. In 1649, an act of assembly was passed against the groundless custom of not burying at the back of the kirk. When the church bell was tolled at the funeral, it was usual, in Aberdeenshire at least, to change the usual solemn funeral knell for a lively peal, more suitable for a wedding than a funeral, just as the corpse was borne through the churchyard gate. The reason for this strange performance was that at that moment evil spirits would be very busy annoying the spirit of the departed, and the bell ringing, it was believed, would frighten them away. But the committal of the body to its kindred dust did not complete the funeral obsequies, says a writer on the subject. A very important rite yet remained. This was the dregi, a term derived from the word dergi, conspicuous in one of the chants for the dead in Catholic times. 
On retiring from the churchyard, the whole company withdrew to the village inn, not to lament over the memory of the deceased, but to have a handsome refreshment. Sometimes the dragy ended in a free fight. The following is taken from the Presbytery Records of St Andrews. 1654, December 21st. The brethren, in their several charges, are exhorted to take notice of dirgies after burials for suppressing them. That's from Jenny M. Lane. It's mentioned there that pieces of the shrouds, etc. were taken as memorials. Hair was taken, and we've discussed uh, briefly so far from the show and tell videos that we have some items made from the deceased's hair in order to memorialise them, have something of theirs to keep with the, the remaining loved one. There are a lot of people nowadays who hear about Victorians taking photos of their loved ones post-mortem and cannot get their heads around just how extraordinarily morbid that appears. In the 19th century, photos were expensive and time-consuming. So people would do it on their own time when they had enough money to be able to make that kind of a purchase. So they would do it for carte de visites, uh, which were calling cards for friends to collect, or they would do it for a special occasion, say attaining 21 years of age. They would then go out to have their photo taken to mark the occasion. If a young person or a child or baby died, there wasn't the opportunity to get a photo of them in life. And being able to have a life-like representation of a person was a fairly new thing. You no longer had to rely on artists' representations of what the subject may have looked like or may have wished to look like. You could see the person in life before you whenever you chose to to have a look at it you could be reminded of exactly how they were so parents would go out their way to have their child look more alive they would have the photographer add blush to the picture perhaps they would have the eyes open they would be propped up and don't get me wrong there were also those who did choose to have the child or loved one in burial clothes or in their coffin. But the majority were looking for something to remember the subject as they were in life, not a reminder of them in death. So they would they would attempt to to try and make them as living like as possible, as alive as possible for the, the pictures that they were to keep the rest of their own lives. So it wasn't this morbid thing, it was out of necessity that they chose to do this. And you can understand why. Nowadays when you're able to snap photos and memorials of everything, a rainbow that's gone a couple of minutes after the photo's taken, etc. We can't conceive. It's harder to get our minds around the idea of wanting to take a picture of a deceased person, especially one so close to us as a child or family member. Being a person that collects these type of effects there is a market for photos of very obviously dead people in coffins, etc. And I don't go in for those. They seem to be fairly highly coveted from the prices you see some of them going for. I personally prefer pictures where it's maybe not so obvious, where there's dubiousness around whether a subject within the photo is post-mortem or not. 
perhaps there's a certain look in a parent's eye that suggests to the viewer that they're not entirely sure why they're going through this process having just lost a child. Why are we going through this farce of having a photo taken? There's there's that emotion conveyed in some pictures from one or both parents. There's also ones where the child is sleeping, but perhaps the way the hand's being held doesn't seem as natural as it would be in a living child. Little hints here and there that serve to make you wonder, is that the scene we're looking at? Or is this merely a, a new family with a new child and looking to document that event of becoming a family? I don't go in for the more morbid, obvious ones, but again, there is certainly a market out there for them. The next article we have is from the Musselburgh News for the 21st of March 1890. It's entitled Scotland in the Olden Times by the Reverend Alex Wright. It's article four of his, entitled Deaths and Funeral Customs. In Scotland, till of late, prognostications of death were superstitiously entertained. When a tallow candle shed grease over the edge, it was held to betoken that the person to whom it was turned was about to die. When death entered a house, the clock was stopped and the dial plates covered. The mirrors also were veiled, and on the breast of the dead was laid a small vessel with earth and salt. The late wake, or watching of the body, was practised till about a century ago. As the vigil was continued day and night, one party of watchers relieved the other. Solemn silence was enjoined, but liquor drinking was unrestrained. Most all late wakes terminated in a banquet on the evening preceding the funeral. The festivities closed with the funeral dance with bagpipe music. Funerals were too often attended by a degrading dissipation among all classes. At the funeral of an ordinary merchant or farmer, often thirty pounds were spent on shortbread, wine and whiskey. Even the departed comforted their later hours by contemplating those miserable funeral orgies. Dean Ramsay relates that an aged spinster lady in Strath's Bay, when she was on her deathbed, called to her bedside her grandnephew and heir, and affectionately charged him that as much whisky was to be used at her funeral as had been drunk at her baptism. Unaware as the extent of the potations on the earlier occasion, the heir allowed each one who attended to drink what he pleased. The result was something which the aged gentlewoman could not have foreseen without emotion. When the funeral party reached the churchyard a distance of ten miles from the place of starting, the sexton's inquiry to the chief mourner, Captain, where's Miss Kitty? aroused the company to the recollection that in resting at the inn they had there left the body on a dike and had started off without it. At the funeral of the Honourable Alex Fraser of Lovett in 1815, several persons overcome with drink fell into the vault, and the carousals which attended the funerals of the Chisholms were accompanied by some fatal incidents. The funerals of Highland chiefs were attended by thousands, the procession extending to miles. At these processions were chaunted at intervals the Coronacher lamentations. Poured forth by an hundred voices, the Coronach awakened the echoes, and as an expression of tragic grief was singularly effective. At Highland funerals, the Coronach was latterly superseded by the Pibruch. One might be permitted to conclude from a notification of the Register of the United Parishes of Glenorchy and Innisale that people lived longer last century than now. August the 24th, 1790, baptised William, son to John Macpherson Piper. At the baptism were present the father and the mother of the child, the grandfather and grandmother, and the great-grandfather and the great-grandmother, the two last strong and vigorous. However, the annual death rate is considerably lower this century than the last one. In 1741, the death rate in Edinburgh was 34 per 1,000. The mean mortality of the city now, as derived from the Register General's return, is 24 per 1,000. This next article is from 
self-righteous to the max, Walter R. Payton. He does, however, cover some of the varying customs surrounding death in Scotland, with only the lack of temperance being his main gripe. It's entitled Scottish Funeral Customs, Dangerous and Unhealthy Practices, and it comes from the Evening Telegraph for the 22nd of June, 1898. It is well that the practice of having services of cake and wine and spirits at coffinings and funerals has been all but stopped through a healthy public temperance sentiment springing up. It is difficult for the poor to provide the eatables and drinkables, and the custom exposed many who attended funerals to the unpleasant charge that they only did so because of the service of cakes and spirits, and that they never attended where there was no service. I have often had to face much bitter, biting opposition by trying to stop these practices, but I succeeded with all but those who were in easy circumstances and were too stubborn to yield to my appeals. I have only once seen a sort of sensible, reasonable service, and it also illustrated the cause of and necessity for, in some circumstances, there being some such service or provision made. It occurred in the Paris of Tinrin, near Thornhill, Dumfrieshire, Scotland. It was at a farmhouse, and the road leading up to it was continued right along the front of the long steading. In a line with the gable wall was a dry stone dyke, with a gate crossing the road between the gable and dyke. In front of the long steading there was a dry stone dyke, running parallel with the front of the houses, and forming the farm close, say twenty feet wide, and also enclosing one side of the garden. Along the front of the house, and also along the dyke opposite to it, planking or boards were placed as high as a kitchen table. On these tables were arranged all sorts of breads and beverages, spirits, wines, beer, milk, water, coffee, tea, and piles of buttered bread, home-baked cakes, scones, bannocks, and all sorts of baker's fancy breads. No person was asked to partake of these foods, but everybody could take according to his tastes and necessities. Some of those attending the funeral had walked seventeen miles, and were consequently ready for a substantial and sustaining refreshment. A profane service. I regret to state that in sensible Scotland and some localities, there still lingers what I think ought to be described as a profane service. There was at first at the House of the Dead a service of reading the scriptures and prayer, then followed what was called the lifting of the corpse, which was taken according to distance by beer or a hearse to the grave, and there silently laid in its last bed. When the grave was filled in, the undertaker called to all to go to the church that night. No schoolroom nor hall large enough was near, and as parties arrived at the church, the baker and the publican, having charge of the service, arranged the people in alternate seats, one seat filled and one left empty to serve as a passage for operations. When the entire company had been so seated, the undertaker would step into the church and call out the name of the minister who was desired to conduct the devotional services, reading of the scriptures and prayer. When these were over, the baker carried round a large tray loaded with what was significantly called funeral bread, sponge cake shaped like a cookie but more flat, the publican followed him with a large tray literally filled with glasses containing port, wine, sherry wine, whiskey and brandy. All the company appeared to be immediately engaged in a huge coughing match. Everyone present seemed to take bread or a sponge cake cookie, only the total abstainers passing the glasses filled with wines and spirits. When the bread had been munched and the glasses carried to the session house, the undertaker again appeared in the church and actually called upon the minister to return thanks. That was a provoking part of the service. It might have been engaged in prayer or close the service, but to call on a minister to return thanks for parties having partaken of one glass of what might before the close of the day lead to many of them being beastly drunk was rather sore tyranny of a cruel system. Often I have been vexed for a young man, say of seventeen years of age, whose father had been laid in his grave, having, in accordance with the tyranny of a cruel custom, to get to his feet, glass of wine in his right hand, and to call out, Here's a the company's very good health, and I thank you all for your presence. 
I was frequently vexed and grieved to see a minister tossing off his glass like the greatest toper present. In the interests of all that is sacred, I felt moved to direct an uncompromising rebellion against that profanation of the house of God. It was at times specially revolting, for example, when it occurred on a Monday, scarcely one short day after we had been in the very same seats commemorating the Lord's death. As a free church minister, the control of the building was so put into my hands that I had full power to prevent such a gross desecration of sacred things, a degradation of holy feelings, an outrage upon Christian propriety, and a foul dishonour to the church. But the opposition, the bitter feelings, and the hate that my veto would have carried forth made me hesitate not from any unwillingness to face and fight to uncamely endure at all, but for the sake of those who would have given themselves up to be triumphed over and trampled upon by such unchrist-like feelings and actions. A triumph over fears. I did, however, vow to face and fight and triumph over all such fears and consequences, rather than allow the new church to be so used, and I kept that vow. On one occasion I wrote to our parish, United Presbytery, and our free church ministers at Strathnaven, asking them to agree to intimate with me, and doing it on the same day, on a Sabbath to be named, that, as sessions were earnestly recommended, that the custom of offering cake and alcoholic liquors at encoffnings and funerals should be discontinued. Not one would agree to join me in so doing, and I had at last to make the urgent appeal upon my own personal responsibility. I have mentioned that vile custom to many persons, but not one had ever heard of such a practice. All had difficulty in believing such things to be a possibility, and every one said with more or less warmth, I would not tolerate such a thing even once. The Dead Watch when I was only a big boy, I remember being one of a party of young people who sat up with a corpse. It was that of an aged woman named Tibby Glover. We sat from ten or eleven o'clock till daylight. Tea was prepared for us and we partook of it before we separated for our respective homes. What specially impressed me was the utter absence of feeling and deportment that might be expected in such close proximity to the dead. For an hour or so at first there was an awestruck, grave, solemn feeling. Then some one of the company would drop into sleep and perhaps snore, and the previous tension and seriousness probably prepared for the greater levity, which, when it did begin, was like commencing to laugh in church, or like the letting out of water, almost certain to get worse and worse till before separating in the morning there would be from feelings of regret, remorse and shame an understanding that no one present was to tell any person of the night's levity and goings-on beside the dead. Parties so sat up with the corpse on every night that intervened between the deceased and the interment. In a country house, so long as the corpse was not laid in the coffin, it was in some danger of being attacked by cats, rats and mice, and hence up till encoffening had taken place, there was some excuse for and explanation for the dead watch, but after that it was a delusion or superstition and a source of much evil. Encoffenings a service of cake and alcoholic drink at an encoffening was much more objectionable than the having of such at a funeral. I had always a suspicion that such a service was but a distant relation of the Irish wake, and at last I had clear proof of it. The mother of a family had died. The father was not a teetotaler. I got a chance of appealing to an elder son against having spirits at the mother's funeral. He said that that was what he wished, and he had had a long talk with his father, who at once objected, stating that they had had such a service at the deaths of several he named, and if they had no such service at her funeral, folk would say it was because they did not love her and respect her memory. That was a clear confirmation and an honest confession of what I had long suspected as being the truth. The the lingering remnant of the superstition that a service of cake and spirits is necessary to show respect for the dead. Another miserable superstition. Another miserable superstition is that it is not right. It is unlucky if all those who are present where a corpse is do not touch the dead brow with a hand and kiss it with the lips. 
In cases of infectious diseases, such practices are of a criminal character and are sheer fatalism. The parties keeping up with such customs and being cautioned against doing so may often reply, Oh, if we are to take it, the disease, we'll take it whether we do these things or not. In two instances and in different homes, I've seen the corpse of a child that had died of diphtheria, kept exposed or uncoffined till another child who was ill and dying was ready to be uncoffined. No matter how infectious the trouble that had caused death might have been, soft sponge cake bread was built on plates and exposed on a dresser or table or chest of drawers. It might be only a few feet from the dead body, and after having sucked in or imbibed germs of disease for hours or days, it was handed round to and eaten by the parties who had attended the encoffening or the funeral. Such practices are an outrageous violation of all hygienic or health considerations. I often give much offence by declining to partake of anything either at encoffenings or funerals. Services at encoffenings should be conducted by elders, for they frequently become very vexing interruption to a minister in his pulpit preparations. Yet when the service is purely of a spiritual character, an encoffening often gives a minister one of the best opportunities of making impressions that may be eternal. Yes, at some of the funerals I've been to in my life, I have found that the ministers seem more set on propagating their religion, on preaching Christian or religious propaganda to the people rather than celebrating the person who has died. And in every circumstance where I've sat through something like that, I have been a little bit annoyed and definitely very much more saddened at the fact that the person wasn't even being talked about at their own funeral. Jesus was, and God was, and we're told about how it's important to have religion in order to get into this supposed other world that lies in wait for us. And that's fine if you believe that. But if you already believe that, you don't need propagandized to or marketed to at what should be purely about one specific person and the life they led. But that's just my thoughts on the matter, I guess. To offset that sentiment, uh, Walter's experience of levity during his sitting up put me very much in mind of my grand's funeral. She was buried in Tobermory in Mull. She was a Maclean from Tobermory. And she had married a Catholic, my grandfather. And that had actually left her in a more liberal position than she had been growing up. She was of the wee free religion over in Tobermory. And that was very restrictive. But she had a more Catholic service in Greenock after she died. And then she was taken to Tobermory. And I was too young to know, I'm afraid, whether it was a wee free service that she had over in Tobermory. But certainly where her ashes were buried. And we're standing around the gravesite. And the priest... He's just talking and, again, not really about my gran. He's talking about his religion and what we can expect in the afterlife, etc. And as he's talking, almost every time he opened his mouth to start a thing, there was a goat in the field just a across the fence from where we were standing at the graveside, who was just bang at him. Just every time he opened his mouth, this goat would let out a meh. And I think I was, I feel like I was maybe 11 years old, 12 years old at the time. And 
I just, I found this hilarious that this goat seemed to be trying to steal the show from this priest. But you can't laugh. It's a funeral. And I love my gran. You know, she she was an excellent person and I kind of wish I had gleaned more from her um, with regards to Scottish history and her growing up in Tobermory before moving to, to Glasgow. So I know that it would be bad to laugh at this time and I managed to restrain myself from that despite this goat's constant interference. But then this minister, this priest, starts singing unaccompanied and really out of tune. And that was the last straw for me. And I was frantic. My mind was racing. And I'm like, I can't laugh. I can't laugh. We're at a funeral, but oh my word, this whole situation is just bizarre. And I thought, my cousin is Catholic. He's been brought up Catholic. Perhaps he's more in control of himself. So I turned to him, frantically seeking some kind of support just from a, a more solemn expression. He's almost himself. And my brother is the same. And I'm. I I don't even know if I let out any kind of a laugh, but that was possibly the most uncomfortable I've been in my whole life, was at my grand's funeral with this interfering goat and the tone-deaf priest standing at a graveside burying my grand. Just, just bizarre. But there you go. There's an anecdote of death from my own life. And Walter's experienced that whole laughing when you know you absolutely shouldn't be it kind of experience, you know. <laughs>